Hey everyone, welcome. We'll be starting at 11.15, but um, Gene's gonna entertain us all with some of his drawings and sketches. Yeah, so um, if anyone wants to go in the chat, uh, even before we start on how to draw anything, if you have any suggestions on something I should draw or explain how to draw, uh, throw your questions in there. Uh, let me see. I will just start. I've already drawn a random librarian. And uh, let's see, I'm going to start drawing something else. Uh, so let me know if you have any ideas. Um, let me see. I, my wife is downstairs right now in the floor below my studio watching a dog, a uh, dog sitting a dog. So I'm going to try to remember what that dog looks like and start drawing her. But if you have other ideas, please just type it into the chat window and I will start drawing that. And there's a really simple trick to drawing a dog. I will, after I start to go a little further in this, I'll explain what I'm doing. And I really like drawing dogs because I like dogs in general. They're wonderful people. Uh, actually, her collar is way up higher. Hold on. She keeps her collar about that high. And here's my trick for drawing dogs. If you want to draw a dog, what I usually start off with is I draw two boxes. First, I draw a slightly bigger one. Then I draw a slightly smaller one. But this one leans on one side, so it's top heavy. Con opacity down. I'm going to draw another layer above this to show you how I draw a dog based on this. And the bigger box is the main part of the skull of the dog. The smaller box is the snout of the dog. And then you attach ears here, which can be pointy or floppy or whatever other shape the dog's ears are. Add a neck. And you have a dog. And if you want to do a tiny dog, you take that first box and you make the next box smaller. Now, if there's anything you want me to draw, just as a suggestion, that'll really be funny or amusing, please, again, throw it into the chat. And if you want to draw a bigger dog, you make the second box bigger in proportion to the first box. So this would be more like a teacup chihuahua for this dog. And this would be more like a Great Dane or something like that. And if you draw those boxes at an angle, Then you can draw a dog from any or a dog's head it from any angle. You draw a little upside down Y here. Draw the eyes, round it off a little bit. But dogs' heads, dogs' heads are actually really, really boxy. And then give it the wedge-shaped ears. And anyone can draw a dog. Uh, welcome to DGPL's first ever library con. So I am happy to be one of the first guests also at this place. So uh, welcome to the con. Uh, I am excited to once again do in-person con someday, but until then, it is really fun to hang out with you here. So uh, again, throw something crazy into the chat that you would like to see me draw, and I will draw it. What do you want to see me draw, Nika? Um, birdie? A big birdie? Oh, birdie. Okay, so let's oh, close Building. Oh, building, building. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry, my headphones aren't the best. So, okay. so a building. Um. Oh, you know, I've been drawing Greek temples lately. Ooh. So, so if you know how to, oh, gotta turn on that layer so you can actually see it. Okay. New layers. This one I'm gonna sketch on. The other one I'm gonna do the finished drawing on. So let's start off. Okay. There we go. 
Okay, there we go. So the most basic way to draw, most buildings are kind of box shaped. Can you draw a box like that? Yeah. So if you can draw something kind of like that, Ooh. you know, you've got we your got basic. Back. There. You've got your basic building. You can stretch one side or the other more or less. Cube. Look at that. And that's kind of your basic, you know, way to draw a box. You make this each side taller, shorter, lengthier. In the case of a Greek temple, the front of the the front rectangle of Greek temple tends to be about the shape and size of an a letter sized piece of paper. Uh, it's in math, known as the golden ratio. Oh. So it's, you can read all, you can Google all about that, but you don't need to know all the details. It's just roughly the shape and size of a letter size piece of paper. And then if you just extend things back, you see how things you just almost form like a grid. Ooh. If you draw a distorted checkerboard, this is kind of a basic technique of perspective, where the, the checkerboard kind of follows the shape of the rectangle. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot more to perspective than this, but this is how I'm drawing a Greek temple. And wow, there's well, going to draw a bunch of uh, the caps on the top of the columns here. And make it, I'm going to, you don't have to do any specific number. In Greek history, the number of columns would change over time. I think it tended to be, yeah, I got six. It tended to be an even number. That way, uh, in the middle, you'd have two columns, and you could walk between them through the front door. Because it's an odd number, then you're walking into the column that's in the middle. Like that's one. Just, if you imagine that checkerboard on the front, you can see how the building works. And then it usually has some steps on it. Drop the and columns. Depending on the design. Lines down in the front here. You see how the that checkerboard, Ooh. that kind of rough checkerboard I did? Down again. Shows you work with the lines. Here's the side of that column. But this one right here. I'm going to draw a bunch of columns here. It's some Greek and Roman temples didn't have columns on the side, which make them easier to draw. But I'm being all fancy here. Can you draw that on the bottom? Over here, little lines across the bottom. Yeah. Across. So this way. Yeah, across. Okay. So this is like my pencil stage I'm drawing here. And then I'm like, this is like I'm going back with uh, a black marker or a pen or something with Wait. permanent ink. And if you want to get all fancy with it, sometimes they'd have little extra decorations on the roof like this. Want to add that little? Box to the top. Yep. Yeah. Like a little box almost on the top here, like this. Yeah. And if you look at a lot of modern buildings that are influenced by Greek temples and stuff like that, right. like even like the entryways, a lot of buildings, they'll just be like, they'll have this triangular pediment on top, and then just two columns, and then a front door in the middle. And you'll see that in a lot of houses. Mm. Like, like what are called colonial style houses and stuff in the United States. Let's go down. Yeah. Everybody. Okay, what time is We're it? We're gonna get started. Oh, official start time. Okay, so I'll just showing, doing you. a little VIP pre-show. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> everybody welcome to the Donners Grove Library's first ever library con we're so glad you're here today um I just want to let you all know that this meeting is being recorded and if you wouldn't mind it would be lovely if you were to turn off your mics um at the beginning of course if you have a question you may you may um turn your mic back on but it'd be great if you were to turn your mic off and open up your chat we'll be monitoring the chat and answering questions as they come in um, 
I want to introduce to you all Mr. Gene Ha. We're so happy that he's here today. Um, he is a New York Times best-selling comic book artist. He writes and draws May volumes one and two from Ani Press. It's the story of May Fortel, a girl who follows her long missing sister, Abby, to a world of mad science and mystery. He's best known for his work with writer Alan Moore on top 10 in its prequel, The 49ers. Gene has won four Eisners, the highest award in American comics, and we're so happy he's here with us today. By the way, I'm Jen Rieski. I'm helping Karen Benarek, our programming librarian today. I'm the assistant director of the Downers Grove Public Library. Welcome. Take it over, Gene. Okay. so. Um... Uh, I wanted to give you a little overview of what I've done in comics beyond just the biography stuff. So um, I started in work, I tried to break into comics initially back in the pre-internet era, back in the 1990s. And um, this is when you could actually just mail a bunch of photocopied art samples to the offices of Marvel Comics or DC Comics. And they would always send you back a letter saying either you have a job with them or you don't have a job with them. And I thought after four years of art school, I would be a shoe in to get a job at Marvel. And that's how I ended up with this rejection letter you're seeing on the screen right now, which is a form letter listing all the things you can do wrong in a sample you're sending to Marvel. It's a checklist. And you see they either check them off or they underline them, except for storytelling, which frankly was a problem too. But I think the editor who uh, sent the letter was just being nice by not checking them all off. But then he, uh, then they added a PS at the end, uh, saying, "You actually have more problems than we thought of before on this form letter. So work on those two, but try again." And I was really depressed for a few days. Hold on a second. I was really depressed for a few days after I got this letter. Um, but then an editor at DC, I'd sent a sample, sent a set of, a set of sample drawings to, also contacted me. And uh, his name was Neil Posner, and he did not offer me a job. But what he did say is he liked my work, and he wanted more samples. Uh, so could I? Could he send me a sample script so I could keep on sending more samples to him? And after a few rounds of this going back and forth, where I'd send more samples, new drawings, and he would send back feedback on what I need to work on. I got my first job at DC Comics, and that eventually led me to getting, just a few months later, getting my first job at Marvel Comics. So um, if you can find people who are willing to help you, uh, who are a little head, that's always really, really helpful. Uh, you can no longer send a pile, you can no longer mail photocopies of samples to Marvel and DC anymore. There are other ways to get in, but uh, ask me about that later if you're interested. Anyway, I'm gonna show you some of the work I've been doing. So uh, when I started in comics, uh, in American comics, it was almost all black and white, black and white line work, uh, which was colored by somebody else. And to get more and more control of it, I began doing what's called cross hatching, which is shading by doing little tiny side by side lines, rows and rows of lines, and then doing other rows of lines at an angle to that cross. You do the hatching lines, and then you do cross hatching lines. You can see that all over here all these little tiny shading lines. Uh, but I would not recommend this because it began hurting my wrist. I began getting carpal tunnel and it was hurting my eyes and it just took forever to do. And I was happy with the effects, but it was just not the best way to get across what I was trying to do. And that's when I discovered eventually Photoshop where I color, began shading and coloring and doing other things uh, on top of my line work. And this is a cover I did for Marvel Comics, obviously, of Captain America. And this is in an alternate world where Captain America has to fight Nazis in America. And you can see there an evil Nazi blimp flying above him. Uh, I've also, of course, done lots more work for DC Comics. This is the uh, Superman of Earth-23. And I've drawn many, many different Supermen of different Earths because there's so many Earths inside the DC Comics universe. Uh, and in this one, this is a uh, Superman who also is secretly the president of the United States. So that's Cal Ellis, president of the United States, who is also secretly Superman. Um, this is a poster. 
it's a DC character I did here, but this is a poster I did for the American Library Association of a famous librarian superhero. So uh, the character is Batgirl. Now you can see her reflection in the window, who by day is Barbara Gordon, public librarian. Uh, I'm also, as uh, Jen mentioned, I'm also famous for my work with uh, Alan Moore. He's the writer of Watchmen, uh, V for Vendetta, and lots of other great comics. And I did top 10 with him. And this is in a world where almost every, oh, this is in a city where almost everyone is a superhero, including the police. So these are all, uh, except for uh, the small Godzilla-like monster being arrested for uh, some small crimes and some of the kids flying in the background. These are all the police of the top 10 precinct. And then of, as uh, Jen also mentioned, I do my own book that I write and draw, not just draw, uh, called May from Oni Press. And it's the story of two sisters, uh, the older one of whom, of, of the two, drags her younger sister to another world full of mad scientists and monsters. But the older sister is kind of a typical action hero who doesn't think through her actions before she starts uh, hitting things. And it's the younger sister who actually realizes they have to be a little more patient if they want to solve the problems that they're running into. Anyhow, uh, that's enough about what I do and uh, samples of the kind of drawings I do. At this point, uh, I'd like to ask you guys for um, what what you would like me to draw. So uh, someone before asked me uh, to draw a building and I was giving some very simple kind of rules of thumb on how to just very quickly draw uh, a building, in this case, a Greek temple. And before that, in the pre-show, I was also showing how to draw dogs. And I can go into more detail about that if anyone's curious. And before then, before we even had the pre-show, I was drawing uh, very friendly, helpful, smart librarians. So um, if you need uh, more advice on how to draw librarians or buildings or your favorite pets, let me know. So let's see. So I'm going to open up some new layers here. And just type it into the chat window or turn your microphone on and ask me a question. Uh, let me see. Until we have a question. Oh, here we go. Can you draw a dog as a Simpson character? Ooh. Okay. So there are dogs in uh, the Simpsons cartoons. So uh, it drawing Simpsons does not follow the rules that um, you I normally use when drawing faces. They're really fun and different. Uh, so I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to look up Homer Simpson on my other computer here, my reference computer, and then I'm going to look up uh, Sims, Simpsons Family Dog, because I can't remember the name right now, Santa's Little Helper. Just before I Googled up, it came up. Okay. Uh, are we allowed to show our own drawings? Yes, if you want to turn on your camera on the side and show off what you're drawing, uh, I would love to see it. Um, let me see what else is there. Oh, uh, also, if anyone has any specific suggestions, I can draw a specific breed of dog as a Simpsons dog. But I'm going to start off by drawing Santa's little helper. Uh, can you draw a superhero cat? Ooh, OK. So we're going to do, uh, I'm going to do, OK. So I'm going to draw a beagle as a Simpsons character. So first, I'm going to show how to draw Santa's little helper, which is the most famous of the Simpsons dogs. So of course, you I, the easiest thing to do is draw off with the googly eyes. And then I'm going to draw Beagle right after this. And it's pretty simple shapes. Here's the basic shapes. So there's basically a sphere, a crescent moon, two more little circles, and then an oval. If you can draw those and draw them at different angles, crescent moon it kind of scrunched up, googly eyes, and a little kind of the brain case there. You can draw Santa's little helper from any any direction. And hold on a second. You're going to fade that out. So consider the purple lines, the pencil lines, like I'm just sketching it in. And then these lines, the black lines in here are going to be essentially the permanent ink 
that I'm doing on top of that after I get the sketch done. Okay, so if you can do that, if you can draw those shapes together and rearrange them just a little bit, you can draw sand as a little helper from it, doing anything you'd like and from any direction. And then you just draw the little banana shapes on top and you have Santa's little helper's ears. Now, I'm going to draw a cat and a dog, or a beagle, specifically a beagle, and a cat as superheroes um, in the Simpsons style. So switching to that, uh, I will look up reference on Simpsons cat because they do not look like normal dogs and cats. Ah, okay, right. Snowball, snowball. Okay, so let's sketch in snowball. Okay, so sketch layer, brush. Oh, see, I've never drawn a Simpsons cat before, but this, the shapes are pretty simple. And usually when people are, when, a, when artists design a character for something like Simpsons or any other thing, like say uh, Mario Brothers or um, Disney um, Mickey Mouse cartoons, they'll start off with some very simple shapes. So that way they can keep the style consistent between different artists. So we're gonna start off with kind of like an upside down hot dog. It's gonna look like a weird hat. So that, if you can draw that, a half moon, a half circle, and then a hot dog together. And then we're gonna add on some spiky shapes. Of course, googly eyes, but in the cat's case, they're oval googly eyes and a small one here, a small oval here. And then the thing that always throws me off on drawing Simpson stuff, I don't look up the reference is the neck is not in the middle of the, uh, on the middle of the head. It sticks off of one side of the head more than I expect. And once you do that, then you have a Simpsons cat. And once you have these basic shapes of how they draw the cats on the Simpsons, you can make it into a different cat. So by giving it most cats heads, as long as they're, you know, reasonably healthy and well fed are pretty similar underneath the fur, but it's the fur shapes that give them different, make them different cats or look like different types of cats, different colors, different fluffiness and floofs in different areas. So by simply going, adding more floofs, I can make this not snowball. And I can make it a different cat. And because it's a superhero cat, I'm going to give it a cape. And a chest emblem, but still a collar to hold the cape on. Then I'm going to draw a beagle. And I used to own a beagle basset, so that helps out there. Let's see, so back to the sketch layer. And let's draw, I'm gonna do this one full figure. Okay, so we're gonna start off again with the dog. This, now this is specific to the Simpsons again. People ask about Simpsons stuff. So we're gonna start off with oval here. The neck is always a little more offset than I'd expect. I'm gonna draw, a. So circle, oval, because they tend to have short, boxy. We're going a little bit um, peanuts here, but I think all the people who work on The Simpsons are peanuts fans. 
Jean, I have a question while you're drawing, if that's okay. Somebody's oh, asking if um, you work in Photoshop or oh, yeah. procreate your ultimate preference. Uh, so, uh, oh, I'm going to take a quick break from this drawing here to show uh, how I work. Uh, for coloring work, I like using Photoshop because the, uh, the color control tools are really wonderful. Um, but I don't like the, I, I love the Apple Pencil for the iPad Pro. Um, I'm not a fan of, I have a Cintiq, uh, a, a Wacom tablet for my um, desktop computer. And I'm not a fan of trying to draw drawings on it. I Painting type stuff, coloring type stuff is really good in Photoshop with a, a Wacom tablet but um, and a Wacom screen, but drawing does not work well for me there. So I like drawing on the iPad Pro. And uh, I'm just gonna show off very quickly the actual stuff I do like for living on the Cintiq. So uh, this is a cover I did for uh, a comic book called Blade Runner based on a movie, but it's a character who didn't show up in the movie, never showed up in the movies. And I'm gonna deconstruct this really quickly. So let's see. And you see how I do things in different layers so I can control the lighting and stuff like that. And that is really fun drawing and shading and stuff like that in Procreate, but it just doesn't have the color tools I like for actually doing full painting. But okay, back to the Beagle. So we do quickly design the Beagle again. Okay. Okay, so, and so breaking down, so it's very simple. Another oval here, uh, Beagles, if you've ever owned a beagle or had to take care of a beagle, you know that beagles really love to eat. If you leave out a bag of dog food, they will eat the whole bag if they can. So they are not skinny dogs given the choice. Little paper towel tube legs. This is not how I draw dogs when I'm trying to be realistic, but simple paper paper towel tubes are a pretty good way to represent how to draw a beagle for the Simpsons. And then let's draw all the details. The closer eye, we draw that first, further eye. I am drawing a slightly dopey looking beagle. Beagles can be really dangerously smart, but this one is not a, one of the smarter ones. Not all beagles are smart, but I love the ones. I love all the beagles. All the beagles are wonderful. I've had dumb beagles and smart beagles, and they're both amusing and fun. But you really have to watch the smart ones. I had a beagle once, a beagle basset once, who. Uh, I added a detail that's real anatomy, not Simpsons anatomy, so I have to get rid of that one. I had a beagle once who uh, we kept her inside of a chain link fence, uh, fenced backyard, and she figured out how to climb up the any corner of a chain link fence as if it was a ladder, because she was just too smart. And I'm going to do kind of a crescent moon shape here with little kind of sawtooth edges to represent the fuzzy tail. Oh, and real beagles tend to have There we go. So that's my Simpsons beagle. Oh, Simpsons beagle superhero. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let me see. We've got another one lined up for you, Gene. How about Napoleon Bonaparte? <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, let me see. I'm going to do a thing on how to draw Napoleon Bonaparte. 
And then we have another question from Lindsay. Um, Lindsay's asking, what kind or type of reference or resource materials should every artist have? And what are your recommendations for sources like books, artists, and sites to use? Okay. Uh, okay, so the most important tools you can have. Um, okay, so when I started off in comics, in the pre-digital Stone Age of uh, around 1992, 1993, um, I used a film camera. We actually had to put a roll of film into a camera. If you wanted to shoot reference of something, uh, then you would take your photos, uh, put the film back into the canister by pulling a little lever, take the canister to a drugstore to get it developed, and then pay extra if you needed it in one hour. Uh, and then I would have photos, which was really expensive and difficult. And nowadays, I'm assuming all of you are like me, where um, you probably carry a camera in your pocket all the time. And you don't have to take it to a drugstore or a specialty shop to get to look at the photos afterward. Uh, so if you need reference on anything that you can see in real life, take uh, reference photos yourself. Um, if you have uh, friends, relatives, uh, brothers, sisters, and stuff like that, who are willing to help you out, um, ask them to model for you. And uh, so if you need, like, I'm going to give you an example of a pose really quickly. If you need to get somebody who's flying, just ask them to pose like this, and you can figure out what a real person looks like when they're flying, kind of, right? Uh, if they do yoga, then you can have them doing, stick their leg out, and then have them fly like this. In fact, if you look at DC Comics, they have a biography page on me, and I did this yoga pose while, it, while they took the photo, and it looks like I'm flying in it, except I have one leg sticking out the bottom. Um, yeah, if you want to see uh, what it looks like when someone's talking on the phone in the way old people like me do it, you can just ask someone to hold a phone like this. If you want to get a look, see what it looks like when somebody's talking on the phone the way uh, young people tend to do it, you can ask somebody to hold a phone like this. Uh, you can get reference on anything. If you need a photo of a bicycle, a building, uh, just take a photo of it from the angle and kind of lit the way you need it. And that's really helpful. Um, so taking your own photos and getting your own uh, your friends to help out is the best way to get reference on anything, if it's from real life. Uh, if not, uh, of course, just image searches. Um, let me see. Uh, you can take uh, also, of course, classes online if you want to learn more about figure drawing, realistic figure drawing. Um, there are like free online figure classes. So yeah, this is just the best way. And I take, uh, I'm just going to very, I'm not going to show you in detail, but um, yeah, I would often have, this is from the era of when I did film photos, but I would have take photos of a friend's head from various angles. And that way I would, and I made the char um, characters on my friends. And then I wouldn't have to have them come in all the time. I just take literally like 70 photos of their head from different angles. So I'd know what they look like when they're smiling, laughing gritting their teeth, things like that. And it was just really, really useful. Um, also for dogs, cats, anything else in real life, just try to get a photo of it when you need it. Um, let me see, oh, uh, reference for source materials every artist have. So yeah, that is the most valuable thing. If you can actually have somebody pose in real life instead of taking a photo, that's even better, but it depends on if they have enough time to actually just sit around or drawing from life, just going outdoors, uh, Drawing trees from life is just fascinating. Um, let me see. Can you distribute work that is based on another character style like this? Ah, okay. Um, you cannot steal. Okay, so uh, the Simpsons characters are trademarked. So Santa's little helper is trademarked. You can't. Uh, you can just. You can post fan art um, online and to a thing like that, and usually the studios don't mind. If they do mind and they send you a letter, please take it down because you'll get into big tr trouble if they object. But most of them actually really are charmed by fan art. Um, you cannot sell it. You cannot take a Mitko drawing of Santa's little helper, uh, put it on a t-shirt and then start selling it on Etsy or something like that. Uh, you'll get into a lot of trouble. Uh, you can ask any of the people who made macrame um, uh, uh, baby Yodas. Uh, and they had to label them as alien space babies. But on the other hand, if you do something in the Simpsons style, which is not one of their trademark characters, like 
bat beagle here that's not covered it's in the style of the simpsons but uh yeah you can you're perfectly free to do that you will get into trouble though if you go on to some place like uh, threadless and try or etsy or wherever and try to sell simpsons beagle bat beagle so that could be a little trouble though you can of course just um if i did something like this and posted this drawing of bat beagle onto instagram uh, and hashtagged at Simpsons, that's probably not going to get into trouble again because it's just fan art. It's not something I'm trying to sell. So that's kind of the vague rules to it. Um, I'm also going to say you'll, uh, once they start up real comic book conventions again, uh, comic book companies and movie companies are usually reasonably tolerant of people um, selling um, fan art in the context of an artist alley, but not online. But the rules are kind of vague on that. And the big rule there is do not get them angry. So I can say, um, I mean, like a really simple way to put this is uh, if you do a drawing of Mickey Mouse uh, riding a bicycle and sell it as fan art in an artist alley, Disney might be kind of patient with you, or especially if you do bad. Marvel and DC are really very tolerant of this. If you do like, say a drawing of Batman riding a bicycle uh, and carrying a picnic basket, uh, DC will probably be charmed and not say, okay, we are, we're okay with that. It's an informal role, we'll let you do it. We're not gonna make any trouble. Uh, if you do pictures of Batman beating up little old ladies uh, and yelling really, really nasty things and trying to sell that as fan art, DC might get a little angry. So if, you, if you're gonna do something like that, if you're going to use their characters like that in that way, don't get them angry. And this kind of applies to Instagram too, where if you have Batman doing horribly offensive, bad things, DC might say, yeah, um, yeah, we're going to apply our copyright, our trademark here. We really don't want you selling that or posting on Instagram or something like that. So anyway, um, oh, a really famous case of this is uh, uh, I think it was Pepe the Frog, who was created as an amusing cartoon character by a cartoonist. And then uh, horrible people began trying to use him as their symbol. And it's been a constant fight for this guy who's not a big fancy corporation with lawyers to get back control of his thing, which I feel really sorry for him. But man, I don't know. Anyway, don't mess with big companies, especially. I'll say like that. But just out of courtesy, also, don't mess with artists like me who can't afford to hire teams of lawyers. We really appreciate it if you don't. So that's the that's the kind of the vague rules that fan that apply to fan art. So if you're not getting the person created angry, you're probably going to do okay. Um. Okay. Uh. Da, 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 reference. Yeah, that's awesome. You do stripper work based on. Oh, are we allowed to show uh, draw a superhero cat? Oh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay. So uh. I'm going to do two drawings of Napoleon Bonaparte. So, okay. oh, come on, there we go. Okay, so the first one is going to be a little bit cartoony, and the other one is not going to be on my computer off screen here. I'm going to do a image search for Napoleon. I basically know what he looks like, but I want to get all the details right. Okay, so the most famous kind of uh, visual of Napoleon is uh, the middle-aged Napoleon when he was kind of a little more round-headed, had a little bit of a, what we would call today a dad bod. Uh, when he was a young man, he used to have kind of long, shaggy hair, and he was skinny and a little bit underfed, and he was literally hungry, um, both for, he was both an ambition and also because he just didn't get to eat enough. He was revolutionary France, um, but let's see. X. So let's start off with, I'm going to start off with just kind of sketching in a relatively realistic Bonaparte. So the way I do that when I'm being realistic, he's got kind of a round head, the eyes go, and if you look at a picture of Bonaparte online, you'll see that what I'm talking about, his eyes about halfway down his head, which is kind of the rule of thumb artists use when drawing realistically. And then I try to just 
get in the sketch stage here, this consider again, consider the purple lines, the sketch stage, like I'm sketching in lightly with pencil. Okay, round head, short hair when he's older. And if I can just, when I'm doing the sketchy stage, get the proportions right, that's the key detail in trying to get a likeness. Uh, there's a legend propagated by, spread by the British who were fighting against him, that Napoleon was a very short man. Uh, for his time, he was actually a little above average. But um, this is just like a funny thing of like, it's like a metric to American measurement conversion thing. British inches and French inches at the time were different lengths. And the British got a wrong figure on how tall he was, and they thought it was hilarious because their math was wrong. So they began saying he was the little corporal. So that is vaguely how I do that. And everything is based in trying to get a likeness or a figure right. A lot of space and proportions, like if you draw the arm too big or too long, you'll see the proportion looks off. And there's a trick you'll see inside of movies and TV shows where an artist will take a paintbrush and they'll hold it up to an image you're looking at. And in my case, I, actually, I can do this to myself because I have the camera here. I can measure how, say, like wide my head is visually, keep my arm, arms kind of straight so it stays at the same distance from my head roughly. I can measure how wide my head is. And then I can, by keeping it at perpendicular or a right angle to my head, or I can see my head is taller than it is wide. But if I take the width of my head, the top of my head to my mouth is about the same distance. Uh, and you can kind of do that with bodies too. So in my case, for my head, we know if I draw a square, same distance on both sides, and then just add a little extra on bottom, that's about the shape of my head. My eyes go about half, a little below halfway down. I've got a decent amount of hair on top. And that's roughly, we have pretty much the portions of my head there. Uh, in Pauline's case, uh, I can look at the height of his head, apply that distance to his arm. His arm is, the upper arm is a little bit longer than his, uh, than his head, just a little bit. And keep, kind of keep your portions, figure out the portions as I'm going along. Anyway, okay, now fun to Napoleon. Let's go caricature, let's make this extreme. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the picture larger and let's have fun with it. So we're gonna draw a Napoleon Big head, little body. We're going to go with the British stereotype that he was a tiny little man. He really did tend to keep his, if you ever look at a picture of him, like the iconic image of uh, Napoleon is he always tucked his hand into his vest like this. So that's why I'm drawing him like that. It was actually something a lot of people did in their painted portraits at the time, but Napoleon looked so cool doing it, it became kind of his iconic thing and everyone else had to stop doing it unless, or they thought they were copying Napoleon, even though he didn't invent it. Okay, so let's get to his face. So I'm gonna make his, to make him look even more baby faced, which is one of his things. I'm gonna make his eyes lower, bigger forehead, make someone look babyish. He's got a little bit of a curved nose. So I'm going to over-exaggerate that. If, and in doing a likeness, if you kind of over-exaggerate what's distinctive about them, that's what makes it a caricature. You just have that striking cleft chin. Also the fact that he's going bald is another reason I'm making his forehead bigger to kind of emphasize that. And then let's do his famous hat, which if you can think of like a, like a tortilla or something like that. And if you took the tortilla and folded one half up 
and then the other half up. And if you imagine there's a lump here, which is essentially the part that fits on your head, that's how his hat's constructed. And that lump in the middle kind of forces that out like that. So that's the shape of his hat. Then it's got some little decoration sticking out of the side, like a sausage sticking out of a, or a hot dog sticking out of a tortilla. That's the famous one. Then he's got a bunch of, almost looks like a fancy blue ribbon, like he's won a prize at a county fair on his hat. So let's draw this in ink really quick. So switching to this, which is represents the ink stage. So the relatively realistic Napoleon. And his costume has a lot of details. So I'm not going to get all of it, but I'm just going to sketch it in very quickly. Excuse me, Gene, while you're drawing, can I ask a couple questions that have come oh, please in? Please do. Yeah, oh. I can just chat while we're doing that. Excellent. OK, so from Sarah, she's asking, how do you maintain character consistency through an entire book? Oh, OK. Uh, this is very much, again, a thing about proportions, where like I've got two different versions of Napoleon here. And depending on which version of Napoleon I do, I just make sure that the most important thing is keeping the proportions the same as they go through the book. So let's say I'm doing a, a book about cartoony baby head Napoleon. And let's look at the design I did here. Uh, I'm going to very quickly, again, not do all the details in because I don't want to spend all day only drawing Napoleon. But we're going to break down what I've done here and then draw him from a different angle. And this is how you maintain consistency in a character. Okay, so I'm being very sketchy because I don't want to spend too much more time on just drawing Napoleon or just drawing this one drawing Napoleon, especially. Okay, so I just drew what looked good to me as far as drawing this Napoleon. I didn't try to measure everything out when I designed him. It's not a super important thing to figure out portions when you're just designing something new for fun. But once you do have this character designed down, hold on a second, I'm going to put him on a new layer. Freehand. Oh, actually, I have lots of space here in the rest of this drawing. I didn't use the whole space. So, OK. So I'm going to measure them out. So remember that thing I did where I took the pencil and I measured things out in proportions? So like uh, height of my head compared to my width of my shoulders. My shoulders are about each shoulder. Each half of my shoulder is about the width of my head, roughly. I mean, you can do that also with the drawing here. So what I'm going to do is, let's see. Let's take a totally different layer here. I'm going to put measurement lines here. OK, so we're going to use red. And you can see the height of his head here is about this. And let's play around with the fun tools in Procreate. Well, we can see his body is not even as tall as his head. So use that as a measurement point. Oh, actually, OK, so here's another thing, fun thing about measurements. Uh, you'll often hear in drawing books that you can measure everything by the height of the head. But if it turns out that you don't think the head is going to be a useful measurement tool, then you can use something else. So let's, uh, let's figure out a different measurement tool. So let's go by the height of something smaller so that isn't bigger than the actual things we're measuring. So I'm going to do the height of his torso. So from his crotch to his shoulder, that big. And let's see how tall he is. So he's, you can see there, about up to his armpit. One, two, 
His whole body is two and a half torsos tall. So, so one here, one here, a little bit extra here and a little bit extra here. His head is about a little under one and a half torsos tall. And then turn that into a square. His hat is two torsos tall. So once we have those proportions, again, and you can turn that into a grid like this. So that's his hat. Very simply, I like a little oversimplified. His head underneath there, another one of these squares. His torso, another one of those squares, and a little bit extra for his legs. And now we can draw our Napoleon with these proportions from different doing different angles, doing different things. His uh, eyes are a little bit below halfway on his face, as I mentioned before. We can take that length of torso and he can do different activities. His arm, you'll see is, you'll see here, his arm is at the same length as his whole torso, which is kind of normal. If I like stand up here, my arm, uh, I need to stand back further so you see my whole arm. My arm is about the same length as my, as my torso. If I cut off, don't include the fingers. So we know his arm is about the same length as his torso. So just extend that out for about the same distance as the torso. And we can draw Napoleon doing anything we'd like. Okay, next. I'm switching to inks now. And once we have that, the proportions down, it's very easy to make him doing different activities and different poses and have fun with it. So this is a totally different pose and drawing than the previous one. And now we can draw Napoleon running. And if you just keep those proportions pretty consistent, I'm gonna show you one more trick about proportions that's really useful, whether you're drawing cartoony or realistic. So this is, if you look at, this is kind of like a paper doll pose I'm doing where uh, in paper doll poses, it's like those skeletons, uh, the paper skeletons you see in windows on Halloween, where they have little metal joints here on the paper and everything, every, every limb stays at full length, no matter what pose you pose that skeleton into, as if it's slammed onto a window, right? Trapped on a window. Uh, but when we look at people doing different poses and animals or whatever, uh, their limbs don't always, aren't always stuck to a window. They can come towards us or they can go away from us, which means the window pose, the paper doll pose is all the limbs and the head and all that at its greatest length. But if they, you change the angle of it so it gets closer or further away from you, it can get shorter, but it can't get longer than the paper doll pose length. So in my drawing of Napoleon here, I can take his arm from going full length and just make it shorter and have it coming towards us. And then we have a different pose. Also, by the way, he is, this is Napoleon flying a kite. Which I have never drawn before. Again, he's got that kind of tortilla hat with a bulge, kind of a big meatball in the middle and then little hot dogs sticking out the ends, which are fancy metallic thread military tassels. But let me get rid of this. So once you have the portions, you can draw your character in any pose that's a paper doll pose 
And then by making any of those proportions shorter, you can have them doing different poses. You can make the torso shorter by having them lean towards you or away from you. But those are the basic ways to keep it. But yeah, that's, uh, that's how you keep a character relatively consistent from drawing to drawing. And going way over here, I'm going to give you a little preview of something I'm drawing to show pages. See. Like in this scene here, you can see the two scenes here. In the one to uh, the left, you see the characters all doing basically paper doll poses. They're standing upright, and their arms are mostly kind of stuck to the window, directly to the side, the front, stuff like that. They're mostly not reaching towards the camera, essentially, or directly away from the camera. But in this scene, to the other one here, to the right, essentially, it's you're seeing them from above, which in a sense is their torsos tilt, uh, their heads and their torsos tilted towards you. And then a lot of things like a, a girl holding her arm up like this, where her hand's coming towards you. You see a lot of these things, or the woman here with the gloves, uh, with the falconer glove, with her arm sticking up, coming towards you. So they're the same characters, but just by shortening the proportions, I can change the poses in different ways and change the camera angles. But there, it uses the same proportions on, on the characters in both scenes. So you can get, you can't get any longer than the paper doll pose, but by shortening it, you can do the different poses. Um, back to Napoleon. I mean, while uh, you're doing that, can I, um, a couple other questions have come in. Oh, please go ahead. Um, Circling back to the um, fan art comment, uh, Lindsay asks, can you use a disclaimer and state that the character is owned by so-and-so and that it's fan art? Uh, oh, uh, I'm going to say that the companies who own the characters uh, appreciate it if you do that. That doesn't give you the right to use their characters without the permission. So if they object, please take it down as quickly as possible before lawyers come after you. Um, but yeah, it's it's always nice to acknowledge that when you do it. Um, that again, the the biggest the biggest way to get into trouble though, is to take your drawing of fan art, and try to sell it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you start trying to sell a product with their character on it, that's when you get into really big trouble, and they can say, "Oh, we're going to take all of your the money you made from selling that, and then we're going to take damages, extra money, which is way more money than you even made." even before costs. So that's when you get into trouble. So like, um, I cannot draw, uh, I cannot draw Mickey Mouse t-shirts and start selling them or stuff like that. Because I promise you within a few weeks, I will be in really big trouble and I will have lawyers coming after me. Um, but if you're just doing fan art posting on Instagram or Twitter or all the fun places that uh, people younger than me go nowadays that I don't know about um, and don't try to sell it as such, you should be okay, but if you do get into trouble, back off as quickly as possible. Uh, if some editor or lawyer contacts you and says, we don't like that, uh, yeah, just back off. But it probably won't happen as long as you're not doing horrible things to the characters that they'll object to. And it's fan art and you're not selling it. So those are the nice simple rules there. Thanks, Gene. Um, Adam submitted a question as well, and he says uh, the finished pieces that you showed at the beginning were very impressive. How long, on average, um, does it take you to finish one of those pieces? Oh, uh, okay. So, like, uh, let me just show really quickly the uh, pages I showed just now uh, from some finished pages. Uh, oh, these are roughs. Uh, well, okay. I, I go through a rough stage where I kind of sketch out what I'm going to be doing. So this is not finished art. This is closer to what I've been doing as demonstrations here. That takes, for these two page spreads, half a day to a day, because I'm really trying to think out like where the lights and the shadows go and what the characters are doing, uh, what the details of the buildings are in front of are gonna be that I'll need reference on later. That takes a lot of, that takes a decent amount of work for me. Then after that, I go to the finish stage, which for this is, essentially very fancy grayscale uh, drawings. This is before I process them in Photoshop. So uh, you can see I've got the, the panels or the boxes of the cartoon storytelling uh, here with a lot of smudges off on the edges. 
And I cleaned that up later in Photoshop because it's easier doing that there than it is inside of Procreate. And I do some other cleanup there later in that stage. These pages, because the costumes designed by another artist are really complex, that can take like two, three days sometimes per page. Uh, I'm also gonna say um, I'm getting older so I can't stay up late as much as I used to when I was younger. And um, so I used to be able to do um, a page like, well, I mean, this one isn't even that complex. Superheroes are nice because their costumes tend not to be crazy detailed. Um, I can, usually in the storytelling, I can kind of choose what I'm gonna do in the background so I can limit it. These buildings are actually relatively easy for me because uh, if you saw the, uh, the sample Roman temple or the Greek temple I did before, uh, I like to break things down into boxes when I'm doing things like buildings. And these are just boxes with little squares on them with little checkerboards on them, I sent. And you just color in the different or outline the different checkerboard squares in different ways. So these are, this is a relatively easy page. And I could do this easily in under a day. And then it probably takes me like one day to really color it because I'm really fussy at it. Though I should mention, there are professional comic book colorists out there who can knock out four or five pages per day about as good as this. Um, I'm doing a few painterly things, what I call painterly things in this, and uh, detailed anatomical things on this, like how I'm lighting the different parts of uh, the little uh, hills and valleys of the face and the around the eyes and stuff like that, that uh, professional colors probably wouldn't bother with because frankly, most people aren't gonna notice, but for me, it's very important. Or also uh, the way I put the highlights on these scales here is, I express the form. You can tell the form just from the highlights, even without the rest of the details, the way those cluster together and get brighter where the, it's closer to the light. And then there's almost no highlights where it's facing away from the light. So I get very, very fussy. So, but if you're not worrying, getting that fussy about it, again, a professional colorist can do this in a quarter of a workday and it'll look gorgeous. It just won't be as fussy and detailed as the way I do it. Um, but yeah, that I was, that was 20, about 20 years ago, a little under 20 years ago, I did that one. Uh, so the age does, age does slow you down. You know, you have parents, you know this. Um, let me see. Doing this one probably took, I didn't do the color on this one, though I gave guidance to the colorist. And this is kind of an example of how that goes. A lot of the fussy details aren't here that I would have put in. Like I would have, uh, you can see how simply the coloring is simple Rel compared to me it's relatively simple the coloring is on this jewelry on this man on his arm there um i would have done individual highlights on the corners of things and each little detail he just kind of smudged them in and it looks great uh so um i did the whole drawing probably uh the perspective figuring out i'm i love i love math i love geometry getting the perspective and the math exactly right on the background building. Took a while, it probably took like half a day of work. Uh, doing the figures, I did a sketch first and then I did the finish. The finish drawing probably took, of oh, just the figures probably took two days. Uh, partially could just designing everything out and getting, also inventing things like these toys. I had to invent these toys of the sea clamps on toy soldier bodies. Uh, and the uh, mechanical uh, stuffed animal bear with a uh, Swiss army knife neck. Um, so yeah, I mean, it could take a little while. Um, it's nice that this is my day job. This is the thing I do for a living. So uh, I can just commit my whole day to it. And if I want to spend 12 hours or uh, work from one o'clock in the afternoon until three o'clock uh, in the morning, um, that's fine. There's no nothing no stopping me from doing that. So that's how my schedule goes. Thanks, uh, Dean. Uh, oh, uh, you're welcome. I want to let everybody know we've got about like seven more minutes left. So if there are any other questions that Gene can answer, we're, we've, asked, we've asked all of them that have come up in the chat so far. So if anybody else has any last minute comments or questions, Gene would yeah. be happy to take them for you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you need, uh, fun different uh, requests and stuff like that. Uh, again, how the business works and stuff like that. Oh, let me mention this also. My website is genehaw.com. And if you look on it, there's a pretty easy to find contact form on it. If you have any questions about art or comics, uh, 
mentioned that you are attended this online panel and I will give that priority. I will try to do my best to answer any questions on art or comics or anything related like that. Uh, if you want advice on things like um, how to deal with your parents or how to, your love life or something like that, I am absolutely the wrong person to ask on that. But things on art or comics, I can help you. Thanks for clarifying oh. that for us. <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you make a unicorn? Yes. Okay, and as so, an action hero? Oh, okay. Um, let me see. Yes, I can do that. Okay, so hold on a second. Uh, let's hide these two layers, add two more. And I'm going to try to do this really simply and quick. So we're not going to do a realistic version and a non-realistic version. We're going to do a basic principles. Uh, wait, how do you draw a horse? And that's the base, of course, of doing unicorn because it's basically a horse with a horn on its head. So I'm going to show you how I draw a horse or a horse's head first. And I'm going to draw this kind of dumbbell-like shape at an angle. And if you can draw this shape, you can draw horses' heads. And this is actually how I draw a realistic horses' head too. And then I start adding some circles to that. And once you connect all that together, you have the basics of realistic horse head anatomy or cartoon anatomy if you want to make it a little simpler. And you see the horse head coming together there. Uh, oh, I'm going to, I want to make this cuter though. So a way to make it cuter is uh, if you want to make an animal like a mammal look cuter and more babyish, make its snout a little smaller. So I'm going to take that end. And there we have a cuter babyish unicorn. And uh, one of the things that endlessly amuses me is that one of our most successful action movie franchises is a bunch of people uh, driving fast cars to save the world from nuclear terrorists and things like that. Because uh, it's not one of the more valuable skills inside of the worlds of like uh, spies and super soldiers. I mean, a little useful, but not that useful. Okay, so, oh, horse body. Okay, so when drawing most mammals uh, and four legged mammals, really quick trick. Then some people will say, you know, it looks like the knees on a dog are backwards or knees on a horse are backwards. But this is the knee. This is the ankle, knee. And most animals like dogs and horses are walking on tiptoe. Shoulder blade is on the side of the body instead of the, under the back. Our shoulder blades on our back. The shoulder blades on a dog or a horse or a cat are on the side of the rib cage. Then they have a very short upper arm lower arm, and then again, they're walking on fingertip, essentially, on the equivalent of us. And that's how you do the body of a horse. Thigh, calf, foot, toe, walking on tiptoe. So anyway, and then I'm going to have this horse showing off its car. Paper towel tube, connect the two wheels on both sides so you can figure out where that goes. Paper towel tube. So yeah, this is a Fast and Furious unicorn. There's a comment from um, Argentina, Jean, that I'll read for you. She says, um, just a comment, Jean, that Marvel DC application looked very interesting to me. It looked like a rubric, but for your drawing, that looks like the easiest project to be graded on. Boy, I wish. <laughs> she says it's amazing.
Horses have long jaws, but they have very tiny mouths compared to the size of their jaws. Oh yeah, and unlike normal horses, they tend to have beards. Unicorns have beards. And I'm going to, the, to all the drawings I do here, uh, I'm going to email to the library. For some reason, I want to give this horse a vest. I think that's like something a fast and furious uh, unicorn would wear. And I'm doing this very sketchy because I don't want to spend all the time just drawing little tiny details. Uh, oh, I have a friend. I have a very successful comic book artist friend who designed the uh, movie Iron Man armors named Adi Granov in England. And one of the things he does because he has designed the Iron Man armor and a lot of other very popular stuff is he collects Porsches. So that's just, this isn't exactly a Porsche, but it's kind of based on a Porsche because I don't want to look it up right now and slow things down. So, and do not ask me how this horse or this unicorn is able to sit inside this car. I have not figured that out yet. But yes, this is a fast and furious car driving unicorn. Okay, so that's my action hero unicorn. Thanks, Gene. Well, you guys, it's like 1215. That hour went by really fast. Um, so I just want to remind everybody to go to genehad.com to go to his website. I want to um, thank everybody so much for coming to the library's first library con. And Gene, if you have any closing remarks, it's all yours. Oh, uh, I am, uh, okay, specifically I'm going to thank Argentina here for noting to me that this car is convertible, which is, I gave it a black top and I didn't even think to myself that it's a convertible. Yes, it is. You are absolutely right, Argentina. Uh, thank you for all for coming. Uh, if you have more questions about how the uh, wor world, of, uh, the business world of arts, comics and all that works, um, if you have more questions on how to draw things that I didn't get to here or didn't explain in enough detail, Again, just write me at my website and I will answer those types of questions. Um, and thank you for supporting your public libraries. Um, my local public library in South Bend, Indiana stocked lots of graphic novels when I was a kid before it was hip for librarians to do that. And that made a huge difference in my life. So uh, you are, we are all very blessed that uh, libraries like the Downers Grove Library supporting arts and literature and comics. So thank you for coming. Thanks everybody, have a lovely day. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Okay, so we're good. Ah, okay, good luck with the rest of the day and with your party. Yes, thank you. Have a lovely day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.